Welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. This is the first Green Left Report, a show that gives a radical, people-powered alternative to the corporate media. I'm Simon Butler. I'm Mel Barnes. The Green Left Report will cover the campaigns and issues that you care about, debate, satire and interviews. Later in the first show, we'll speak to Cathy Finlay from the Support Assange and WikiLeaks Coalition about the campaign to defend WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. We'll also speak to Green Left TV's Paul Benedek about the sorry state of Australia's mainstream media and the need to build an alternative. And Carla Sands will join us in his corner to talk about Australia's mining billionaires. And at the end of the show, we'll be honouring someone with a very special award. But first, Austin McKell, an Australian journalist based in Cairo who reports on Egyptian politics. He spoke to Greenleft TV's Patrick Harrison. Since the interview took place, Egypt's High Constitutional Court ruled to dissolve Egypt's parliament. Activists have labelled the move a coup, an attempt by the army to stay in power. In February, Mikkel was arrested while reporting on an attempted general strike. Harrison asked him about his case. Well, we're still not clear whether we'll be taken to court or not. We, what we've got have been called preliminary charges. The uh, General Prosecutor's Office, they're meant to decide then whether it goes to court or whether the case is archived. But that's been the case for the last three months, but we don't have any idea um, when to expect a resolution. My, my passport was taken when I was arrested and it's been along with my, my laptop and my camera. And the, the main thing is that I'm, I'm not allowed to leave the country as well while this um, is going on. You know, I can't travel home to Australia or anywhere else. From the beginning, this has been a sort of an act of political thuggery. The Australian government should have the, the gonads to speak out on that, and it, as it should have for all the human rights abuses committed by uh, the Egyptian military. There's a silence on that as there is on so many other issues because it's you know, Washington says to be quiet about it, so we do. My case is nothing compared to what happened to someone like David Hicks or Mamdu Habib. Mamdu Habib, of course, rendered here or kidnapped here uh, and tortured. He, he alleged the Australian government's complicity in that. Well, the first round of the elections show that the Muslim Brotherhood and remnants of the old regime, the Farul, are still, you know, still able to outcompete the revolutionaries in terms of uh, an electoral process. Uh, the winner by a, a small margin was the Muslim Brotherhood's candidate, uh, Mohammed Morsi, the, and Ahmed Shafiq, who was a PM under Mubarak, actually just appointed at the very last minute. And that looks like it's going to be now a final race between those two, um, which is a huge disappointment for the revolutionaries. There was a left-wing secular candidate called Hamdin Sabahi, who didn't have you know, the sort of resources and machinery the other time he came in uh, third, he was also competing for the vote with Abu Fatouh, an Islamist who'd split from the Brotherhood towards the moderate side. Of course, many of the revolutionaries boycotted the first round. Most revolutionaries, in terms of people who have been you know, active on the streets, are still saying the streets is, is, is a battle has to Hamdan Sabah, he really ran as the sort of the poor man's candidate. His party is Nasser, a spirit of sort of pan-Arab socialism. There's basically a constant occupation now in Tahrir Square. At the moment, it's got a lot of people protesting. Uh, there were a few hundred there, at least earlier today, protesting the election results because there were allegations of fraud. The square's been pretty much permanently occupied. All throughout 2011. Foreign Minister Bob Carr to speak out about Mikel's case, you can tweet him or call the Department of Foreign Affairs. Details are on the screen now. Australia already has the most monopolised media in the Western world and it's about to get worse. Rupert Murdoch owns about 70% of Australia's print media while Fairfax owns most of the rest. The outlook for Australia's media workers and journalists is bleak. Fairfax has just announced it will sack 1,900 staff, News Limited's tipped, to follow with mass sackings of its own soon. Green Left Weekly's Paul Benedict joins us in the studio to talk about the launch of Green Left TV, which aims to challenge Australia's corporate media monopoly. Welcome, Paul. Thanks very much. Uh, Paul, mining billionaire Gina Reinhart's grasping for control of Fairfax Media, and she's very open that she wants to influence the editorial line of the paper as well. Um, one of her advisers recently said that he believed that newspapers are not a public service, they're simply profit-making businesses. Seems to me that Green Left TV is the exact opposite of what Gina Reinhart wants for the media. Yeah, well, we're seeing corporations 
treat the media basically as their plaything uh, to look after their corporate interests. Um, on our street screens, media is becoming not about informing us in any way, but about selling, selling a product, but also selling the, the system that they want, selling Gina Reinhart's mining interests. So we can see Gina Reinhart will not support uh, environmental coverage that will threaten her mining uh, empire, but there's no coverage of exploitation of labour that she wants to see in her mines. This is why we launched Green Left TV, to try and be that alternative that actually stands up for the 99% that don't get a say in the corporate media. So Paul, Green Left Weekly newspaper has been around for 20 years now and you've recently launched Green Left TV. So can you tell us what you're hoping to achieve with Green Left TV? Well, we want Green Left TV to be the same thorn in the side of the corporate media as Green Left newspaper has been and, and continues to be. When you see the, the rubbish that we're subjected to in the news, the current affairs, the Kim Kardashians and Lara Bingles, um, we want to see a very different sort of media that takes inspiration from the democracy nows of this world, from Julian Assange's new program. Uh, in our first few weeks, we've had David Hicks's first ever rally speech. Um, we've had coverage of battles between students and police at universities. We've got satire of the voices like Carlos Sands that give a different take on things. But the question is, you know, what do people want to see? What do people, progressive people, want to see? And how can they contribute to that? Because Green Left TV is about being a political weapon for the 99%. It's not about what we just here think, it's about what other people want to contribute to it. So anyone who's got a camera, who's got a phone with a camera in it, can film for Green Left TV. They can come in and get activist film skills, they can contribute, share the ideas around, but also we need donations. We're launching a fund drive appeal in the next couple of months, but also donations of equipment and also time and skills um, to be part of the team to provide this media for the 99%. Well, thanks for joining us, Paul. Um, coming up, we're going to speak to Cassie Finlay, our support WikiLeaks activist, about the campaign to defend media freedom. It's a time of economic crisis. This is the biggest crisis since the Great Depression, and capitalism can't solve it. A time of climate emergency. Countries like Kiribati are already suffering from climate change. But the big corporations put their short-term profits before the very survival of the planet. A time of global resistance. People across the world know that the system serves the 1%. Young people are taking to the streets in the thousands in support of equal marriage rights. A time of revolution. People power, led by the young, has toppled dictatorships. Now it's time to topple the whole rotten system. If you think people and planet are more important than profits, then you should come to the Resistance Conference in July. Resistance National Conference is an inspiring gathering of young people from around Australia to share ideas and experiences on how to unfuck the world. Guests from across the globe. Right now, massive student mobilisations are rocking Quebec. We are very excited to have a student representative from CLASS, one of the largest and most radical student organisations in Quebec. The people of Malaysia are fighting against dictatorship and we'll have someone from the Socialist Party of Malaysia at our conference. And we are proud to have a representative from the Palestinian People's Party speaking at the Resistance National Conference. Resistance National Conference, July 20 to July 22nd at University of Adelaide, South Australia. Register now, resistance.org.au. Now we'll head over to Western Australia, where two activists from Friends of Palestine are facing court on June 28. Their crime? Singing Christmas carols in December last year. Green Left TV reports on the campaign to bring these dangerous criminals to justice. Well, I, for one, am glad these Christmas carol criminals have finally been caught. Oh, you better not shop, you better not buy. Each dollar spent here helps fund apartheid. Secret shops are spoiling our town. In what has been described as an heroic act by WA police, two notorious criminals have finally been caught. Alex Bainbridge and Miranda Wood were charged in December and will now face trial on June 28 for singing Christmas carols. At first I didn't realise the group was protesters. I thought they were just carol singers until I heard what they were singing and noticed a guy with a video camera. The group was singing the tune to Jingle Bells but the words had changed and I heard something about secret. Don't bring us your stolen beauty, we won't go until there's justice. We wish you a lot of business and no profit next year. They changed the words to the songs. They really shouldn't have done that. 
The deluded duo of Christmas Carol Crims believe that their actions could help the long-suffering people of Palestine by shining the spotlight on the actions of cosmetics company Secret. They say that Secret is an Israeli company which sources its product from the Dead Sea in occupied Palestine and is therefore a legitimate target of the international boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign. Secret is a beauty company. We just want to see more beauty in the world. Those protesters are telling a pack of lies about us. So is it true that you're an Israeli company? Oh well, that bit is true. And your product comes from the Dead Sea? Oh well, that goes without saying. We don't want to be bothered by illegal settlement, occupation or human rights. We just want to do our shopping. I think we have to be clear about what is at stake here. If these protesters and others like them around the world are successful in their goals, then human lives could be saved. The illegal apartheid wall could fall. That's how serious this is. Police believe the Christmas Carol criminals are just the front people for a vast conspiratorial organisation called the Friends of Palestine WA. Well, we know there's more than just the two of them involved, but we haven't been able to pin anything on the rest of them. But rest assured, we are watching them. Friends of Palestine like to present themselves to the world as if they were solely interested in supporting Palestinian human rights. But the reality is, this is a group that is dedicated to the cause of supporting Palestinian human rights. Police believe that this pair of miscreants will be trying to drum up public sympathy by holding a protest outside the courthouse on June 28. We have intelligence that there will be another protest outside the Perth Magistrates Court on June 28. Well, I wouldn't be going anywhere near it. I think parents need to be warned that if their children do attend this protest, uh, look, the reality is they're going to be contributing to an international movement for justice in Palestine. But will the police allow the protest to go ahead? The WA police has a very long and proud history of supporting the rights of protest, so long as within the bounds of the law and it is peaceful. But what if they start singing Christmas carols outside the court? Well, obviously we couldn't allow that. Next, Green Left Weekly columnist Carlo Sand says what he thinks of Australia's mining billionaires. Politics in this country. Sometimes it seems to be nothing more than a magic trick they've invented for young children, where they say, look over there, look over there. Can't you see the boat people? Look, they're taking all your tax money and your jobs and you're eating all your bread. And you look, and they're behind your back. There's Gina Reinhart nicking all your resources. It's not like that stuff's renewable. I mean, what are we going to do when there's no more to flog off to China? Take turns filing in to check out Gina Reinhardt's huge bank balance? It's going to be really hard to rebuild a tourism industry after this, you know? Like, you'd be standing there sort of going, well, here, the scenery used to be beautiful. It used to just be amazing. And then, uh, well, we put a big iron ore mine right there. And that, that was quite beautiful, too, when it was flowing and it was all just going. And, and now, now it's... Um, uh, it's, uh, um, have you seen the big banana? Uh, you've really, you've, you've got to get there. And the media and the politicians fawn over these people. They change the English, English language for these corporations so that their owners, their owners get to be called the miners. As if Gina Reinhart has ever picked up a shovel and put on a hard hat and just gone out and started digging a hole. You know, Twiggy Forrest, I'm sorry, he doesn't actually mine. Clive Palmer? Have you seen Clive Palmer? I think it's a pretty safe bet. We can say with some certainty, the only thing Clive Palmer has ever fossicked for in his entire life is an hors d'oeuvre that fell under the table at a cocktail party. I'm pretty sure they have people who do that sort of thing for them. But it's not a surprise right? when, when these people own the media and they own the politicians. Take, take the scandal involving the WA Liberal Party. You know, court selling big businesses exclusive meetings with top Liberal ministers uh, for 25 grand. And Premier Colin Barnett still maintains a straight face and said, these corporations, they don't want any kind of influence for their 25 grand. Presumably it's just the joy of being in the same room as people with such profoundly beautiful and wonderful personalities as the WA Liberals. You only have to think of, of Transport Minister uh, Troy Buswell. You know, he's a man caught up in one of the most bizarrely perverted sexual scandals ever, where he admitted to sexually harassing a female staffer by sniffing the seat 
she had been sitting on. Now, it's, it's an outrage this bloke still got his job. But you have to admit, if you had 25 grand to spare, you'd be tempted to spend it on a meeting with him just to see what he'd do. I mean, think of the pub stories you get. You're like, oh no, man, I'm not making any of it up. That's true. I swear to God, it's true. And then, then he starts dry humping the curtains. No, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the refugees that cop. The refugees taking our jobs. The media, they're, they're the ones that they're going on about. They're the ones that Daily Telegraph, Murdoch Press, you know, go on about. There's a story in there today. I read it today. They found a new thing that these refugee bludgers are coming here for. They're now coming here so that they can take our reality TV shows. I'm serious. I'll read this. It says, if we don't find a way to stop these boats, experts fear next year's winner of Australia's top next master block home renovator wants a farmer to marry my boy could be called Muhammad. No, it's, it's quite obvious. It's that desperate Tamil family fleeing genocide huddled onto a dodgy boat to come here and ask for nothing more than a guarantee of protection that they are entitled to under international law. That's the threat. Not these huge corporations with their billions of dollars of government subsidies, uh, destroying the environment, sacking workers at the mere hint of a dent in their profit margins, and you know, campaigning to throw out any prime minister who has the gall to dare suggest maybe they should pay just a little fucking tax. Thank you, Daily Telegraph, for making that clear to me. I'm Carlo Sands. That was my corner. Thanks, Carlo. The fate of WikiLeaks is one of the most important issues facing media freedom in the world today. WikiLeaks has exposed war crimes, corruption, and the lies governments tell their people. For that, elite interests, and especially the United States government, are out to silence WikiLeaks and make an example of its founder, Julian Assange. At a May 31 rally in Sydney to support Assange, former Guantanamo Bay prisoner and torture victim, David Hicks, made a powerful and moving message of support for Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Governments who promote themselves as nations that as a matter of principle and law, enjoy freedom of expression, speech and the press, Julian Assange is a journalist, a brave and selfless journalist who is not afraid to publish information for our benefit, though there should be nothing to be afraid of. Julian has done nothing more than act in the spirit of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, truth and transparency in his professional capacity as a journalist. You can watch David Hicks's full speech online with Greenleaf TV. Joining us is Cassie Finlay, a founder of BeatTheBlockade.org. Uh, Cassie, WikiLeaks has come under relentless attack from governments and from some sections of the media for its journalism. Why do you think it's so important to defend WikiLeaks right now? It's always been important to defend WikiLeaks. They are a, a very small, independent, free press publisher who has published uh, the largest series of leaks of, of classified US government information in history. Um, so it's a real David and Goliath story. Um, and as a result of their publishing activities, particularly since mid-2010, uh, they've come under a sustained political, legal, trial by media type of attack. Um, most notably, of course, uh, with the attacks on the uh, editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange. And that has come to a head uh, just in recent weeks with the decision by the UK Supreme Court uh, that uh, the extradition order against Assange should be upheld. We, we actually wanted to ask you about that, Cassie. Uh, mm. So what would you say to those who say that Assange doesn't want to get extradited to Sweden because he's trying to avoid the allegations of sexual assault? When you look at the Swedish case, I mean, of all the sort of uh, strategies that have been deployed against WikiLeaks and Assange over the last year and a half, some have been very carefully planned and orchestrated, and some have, in my view, been rather more opportunistic. And I, I think I'd put the Swedish case into that category. So, so yes, this matter arose in, in mid-2010, uh, whereby complaints were made. And the complaints being uh, around uh, sexual behaviour has been extremely convenient, I would suggest, for, for those people who wish to um, manipulate and to use this matter to effectively shut down and disable Assange as editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks. Of course, these are important matters to discuss, but um, 
this man has not been charged with anything. Um, and certainly none of us are in a position to, to judge or to make any kind of speculation on, on the details of, of this particular case. And the other thing is it actually effectively shuts down any kind of rational consideration of what are some of the other more significant aspects of the case in terms of political interference and, and, and abuse of process. What a lot of people don't know is that uh, after the initial complaint was made, he uh, went to, to an interview with the Swedish police. The prosecutor in the case had actually dropped some of the more serious charges at that time. He answered some questions uh, and was let, you know, to, left to his own devices. Um, he stayed in the country for five weeks and made other offers to, to be interviewed, all of which were declined. He sought permission from the prosecutor to leave and this was granted. And subsequent to that, and some would argue as a result of political interference uh, and persuasion, uh, the more serious charges were brought back in, uh, a European arrest warrant was issued for him, an Interpol red notice was issued. Now that's the kind of legal device that's been uh, issued for people like Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, so we saw then an escalation of this matter where he had already offered and uh, had you know, been ma making himself available uh, with the express purpose of then, once he'd left the country, getting him back into Sweden. The concern there is that the uh, Swedish government and the United States government have this bilateral treaty in relation to uh, extradition, which provides a very fast-track extradition process, if you like, to the United States. No wonder that uh, he's been fighting for over 550 days now not to uh, return to Sweden. Well, the other, other fight that Assange and WikiLeaks has on their hands is against uh, an unlawful banking blockade um, carried mm. out by groups like MasterCard, Visa mm. and um, PayPal. You've had a bit to do with organising against um, this blockade. Um, why are they blockading WikiLeaks and who is behind it? Mm. I mentioned earlier that there's been a range of strategies deployed against WikiLeaks and Assange and uh, some of them are very much uh, attacking him personally, uh, some of them have attacked the reputation of the organisation. If you want to shut down uh, a publishing organisation like WikiLeaks, you have legal options, um, but in the past WikiLeaks has defended their publishing activities in court and won every single time. That You've exhausted all other opportunities. You, you choke off their supply of funds um, and disable them that way. WikiLeaks re relies entirely on supporter donations. Um, they're an independent organisation. They have no corporate backers, no advertising. There's been a financial blockade uh, effectively with um, companies like Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Western Union and Bank of America uh, ceasing to process payments to WikiLeaks from December 2010 and cutting off 95% of their income. Um, uh, when you ask the question, who is behind this, um, I don't need to speculate much. There's plenty of evidence around um, the kind of pressure that was put on these companies by the United States government as part of their retaliation for the leaks. The PayPal founder, Peter Thiele, said uh, openly in a group of people, look, when you're under that kind of pressure uh, from the government, you cave. We saw the pressure being exerted not only on the American companies but of course in Australia here as well, where more recently we had the CEO of MasterCard in Australia, David Masters, basically um, acknowledge that it was prejudicial statements like those of Prime Minister Gillard in early 2011 saying WikiLeaks was illegal, which is absolutely not the case. Um, David Masters said, well look, we, we simply couldn't uh, you know, provide services under our terms of, of service to, to that kind of organisation. So, um, both, both the United States and the Australian governments, in my view, uh, have, have had their role to play. So thanks for joining us, Cassie. And here's some more about the banking blockade. Twenty secure phones to assist in staying anonymous? $5,000. Fighting legal cases across five countries? $1 million. Upkeep of servers in over 40 countries? $200,000. Donations lost due to banking blockade, $15 million. Added cost due to house arrest, $500,000. Watching the world change as a result of your work? Priceless. There are some people who don't like change. For everyone else, there's WikiLeaks. To find out more about WikiLeaks financial blockade and how to donate, Please visit 
wikileaks.org forward slash support dot html. Finally, it's time to present the Green Left Report Prize, which today we've titled the Really, Really Ridiculously and Obscenely Wealthy Award. Today's winner goes to a woman whose wealth grew by almost $19 billion last year, Gina Reinhart. For every second that passed last year, Reinhardt made more than a minimum wage earner made in a week. Reinhardt's fortune is now so big, if she spent one million a year, her money would last for 29,170 years. She has about 41 times more money than the GDP of East Timor, population 1.3 million. She could buy up the economies of the world's tens, 10 poorest nations and still have about 22 billion left over. One in seven people, a billion people around the world, don't have enough to eat, but Reinhardt can feed them all for a year. She won't feed any of them, though. She says she needs all that money for herself. And that's why we're proud to present Gina Reinhardt our special award for being really, really ridiculously and obscenely wealthy. That's the end of the Green Left Report. We hope you'll tune in next time when we'll be joined by independent journalist Anthony Lowenstein who's just released a new book of essays reflecting on the left in Australia today. We'll also be joined by guests who will discuss with us the significance of the Greek election. Until then, you can keep up with media for the 99% by subscribing to Green Left TV's channel on YouTube or by visiting us on Facebook. Goodbye. Goodbye.